Meet me at the Dunbar Hotel. Meet me at the Dunbar. Meet me at the Dunbar Hotel. Come on and meet me at the Dunbar, the Dunbar Hotel on Central Avenue. They had this great big old party at the Tom's other night. Was I there? You bet. I never in my life see such a sight. All the folks from Fourth Plantation was invited, and they come. They come trooping thick as chilling when they hears a fife and drum. Everybody dressed their finest. Hesh your mouth and get away. Ain't seen no such fancy dressing since last courtly meeting day. Gals all dressed in silks and satins, not a rank on their crease. Eyes of batten, teeth are shining. Hair brushed back as slick as grease. Oh, Central Avenue. All the people look so fine. Every man's shoe has a spit polish shine. Summer 1942 and World War II, the war to end all wars, is raging in the European theater and on the Pacific. Freedom is at stake, democracy is on the line, and decisions are to be made. For those men and women of color of the United States who have always been in a combat at home, the question is, do they simply continue to remain in a never ending combat zone of a country that sees little value in their worth as human beings? Or do they again make a statement that could once again go unrecognized and ignored? Prominent members of the black community have convened in Los Angeles' Dunbar Hotel to debate whether black men and women should take part or not. Should we fight for the rights and privileges we've never fully enjoyed? or leave the citizens of this country to their own devices and to fend for themselves. Every time I see one of them planes, I'll be thinking, what if a beautiful Japanese plane, when you see one because they got the sun on the side? Still makes me wonder. And that one was flying way too low for me. And them Japanese ain't thinking about us. We American, Amy. Long as we American, they be thinking about us too. Hmm. Ain't that stepping fetch you just drove by there in that packet right there? Yeah, that's him, all right. People talk about that man like he a low down, dirty dog, and he driving the packet. I'm gonna get me one one of these days. I thought she would have had you one by now. Me too. But with my wife and all my children, I can't keep no money. I just get my check and just hand it over to them. Just take my advice. Don't let no woman spend all your money for you. Lori ain't the kind to do that. Hmm. Why every time I mention Gloria's name, I get the feeling you know something I don't know. I ain't said nothing. People don't always talk with their mouth, you know. If I tell you what I know, you know just as much I know. How much sense that made? The ghost of Paul Lawrence Dunbar walks up and stands by Pee Wee. What's wrong with you? Nothing. Something wrong? Look like you've seen a ghost. I got. I got to go. Pee Wee takes off. The ghost of Paul Lawrence Dunbar follows him. Well, where you going to? You know that woman gonna drive you stone cold crazy. I think that's James Cagney. You dirty, stinky rat. Charlotta Bass walks up. Lennox, you all right? Oh, yes, ma'am, I'm fine. Oh, okay. Um, now, if you say so. Have you seen my nephew, Kenlon? He went inside a little while ago, but I ain't seen him since. Charlotta enters the hotel and walks into the lobby, which is being turned into a meeting area. She begins pulling out pamphlets. Kiwi returns, still looking around. You come back to your senses yet? I got all my senses. Could have fooled me. I thought you and Glory was going out tonight. We is. 
I got some kin folk come in from Alabama. They downtown in Bronzeville. We fitting to go down and sit with them for a spell. Ain't nothing but trouble in Bronzeville ever since they locked up all them Jackson color folks moved in. You gotta be careful now. Paul Robeson walks up. Evening, Mr. Mr. Robeson. Evening, Mr. Robeson. Robeson. Evening, gentlemen. Paul Robeson enters the hotel. Something big going on in there this evening. All the big, important people here. On a Monday night, too. In the meeting room, Charlotta welcomes Robeson. Lucius Lomax crosses from his office just as Chester Himes walks up on the outside. Chester Himes enters and walks by Lomax and PV without speaking. I wonder what they want him in there for. Himes enters the meeting area. About time you be leaving, right? Yeah. We're gonna leave from here and take the trolley downtown. Almina rushes up. Evening, Lennox, Kiwi. Before they can respond, she rushes in. Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois entered. I guess we can get started. Just about everyone is here. We're just missing Reverend Clayton and my nephew, Kenlock. No telling where he is. First, let me say that I am overjoyed that you all answered my call. I figured it would be better to have you all here at the Dunbar than try to speak to each one of you individually. The problems of the world continue right outside these doors. Issues that affect all of us. I don't need to tell you that these are very serious times. Well, I best be going. Pee Wee enters the hotel and begins to walk up the steps. Leave me alone. You can see me? Yeah, I can see you. Leave me alone. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not that kind of spirit. You sure? I promise. How can you see me? The old folks say I was born with the with the veil over my face. Oh. Hi, I'm Paul. I'm Pee Wee. Yes, I know. Nice to finally meet you, Pee Wee. Me too. You's the, the third ghost I done seen, but the other two was mean as hell. That's why I've been running from you. No need to run from me anymore. My full name is Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Paul? Lords Dunbar? <laughs> Holy moly, no one would ever believe this. Glad to finally meet someone I can talk to. Gets pretty lonely uh, sometimes. Being it's a brand new hotel, I'm the only spirit here. I, I never thought of it that way. That, that makes sense to me. A door to the hotel opens and John Kenlock comes out zipping up his pants. Good. God, that woman right there is driving me crazy. Wait right there. I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> so I, I just want to say thank you, Mr. Dunbar. You've been a... Hey there, hey, Pee-wee. Who are you talking to? No, nobody. Just, just talking to myself. Uh, well, don't do that too often. People might take you to the crazy house. Okay, let's get started. I, I just got to get this off my chest because I've been wanting to scream about it ever since it happened. Please go right ahead, Mr. Himes. Can I wipe lipstick away? Hey there, everybody. <laughs> so I'm late. The U.S. government has got no right, no right to be putting those Japanese people in those internment camps. You may as well call them concentration camps because that's what they are. What the government is doing is wrong. That may be true, but tonight, I would like for us to focus on Negro involvement in the war. Oh, don't worry. I have a lot to say about that too. 
Mrs. Bass, it is difficult to focus on the war and not include the Mexicans and the Japanese. They are going through it more than we are. The police and the military are beating Mexicans up as we speak, arresting them and putting them in jail. That's right. And they want everybody to believe it's because of the zoot suits in the Sleepy Lagoon case. But everybody knows it's racial. That's all it is. People are tired and are standing together and fighting back like never before. I understand. Now, I don't want to exclude the Japanese or the Mexicans, but we need to discuss Negro involvement in the war first. Now, once we know what our position is, we will be better prepared to help others. May I? Uh, please, Dr. Du Bois. My stance has evolved over the years. And there are beliefs I swore by in 1918, but I don't adhere to today. I am ashamed to say that I actively recruited black soldiers into World War I, most specifically Mr. James Reese Europe. The military band leader whose 369th Regiment from Harlem fought bravely enough to turn the tide of the war and without the support of the United States Army, because as you know, he fought under the French flag. That notwithstanding, we won the war only to come home to meet the same bigotry, racism, and hatred we had left behind. There were more lynchings in 1919 than there had been in previous 10 years. Hmm. Our Red Summer, as it is adequately called, that included East St. Louis and Tulsa, Oklahoma. History, needless to say, has left a profound effect on me. And I cannot, as a man of good standing in our community, ask young Negroes to go to war and die for this country. Fighting a war is not a substitute for social reform. Bears repeating, it is not. Thank you, Dr. Du Bois. My family is from Brenham, Texas. All the little matches started out in Texas before we moved to Chicago, then half of us come out here to Los Angeles. Now, I hear people talk about Alabama and Mississippi, but can't get more racist than Brenham, Texas. <laughs> I, I'll never forget when I was a, a little boy how the Ku Klux Klan come through and, and just started lynching people because a, a black man looked in the direction of a white woman. Mm. And those white folks started killing every black person in sight. That's when my family moved out. <laughs> white folk and name miss. I'm, I'm with Dr. Du Bois. I can't go out there and, and tell people to support fighting in a war. I'd lose all my credibility. It is my belief that we send a stronger message by not participating or supporting what I consider to be a fascist government right here in America and it would be payback for the travesty of the Red Summer. Mm. I cannot stop thinking about Black Tulsa. It was a happy place. Mm. People wore new clothes, looking successful and good as a shiny brand new silver dollar. Yeah. White folks couldn't tolerate it. They set fires and leveled the city to the ground, <laughs> shooting, killing, and looting. And here we are, 25 years later, and the scars are still here, just as the scars are still with me. Mm. Thank God for the grit of Black Tulsa. We can never forget. Never. I'll never forget that time either. I was just 23 years old, making my way to Chicago when I stopped in Tulsa to visit a friend of mine. Now, my friend owned a thriving business and, and, and didn't need nothing from no white people. What kind of business did he own, Mr. Lomax? <laughs> Ain't so hard to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> Off the record? Off the record. He wasn't doing anything illegal, mind you. The town people wouldn't, they wouldn't have that. Uh, he had several liquor stores and, and a saloon. He was trying to keep up with the local churches. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot, those Negroes even had their own bank and, and loaned money to white people. And those white people couldn't wait to take the Negroes down just because they proved that colored people didn't need no white folks for nothing. We don't need them for nothing. They need us. Mm. But, but, but they get mad because they do. 
Now you think you think they're going to treat us right for going over there to fight? Be just like World War One, just like Dr. Du Bois said. That white girl, what was her name? Ah, Sarah, Sarah Page. She said Dick Rowland never intended to touch her. Huh, touch her? They had it where he raped her. No, I can't trust them. You can't trust them. Now, I know we're supposed to be talking about the war, but this just proves my point. Here's the Tulsa. Here's the Black Wall Street. Black, Black Wall, 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 Wall Street. Street. Very, very Wall strong Street. points, Dr. Du Bois, Lucius. But we need to ask ourselves, what are we going to do to bring about the changes we need right here in America? I think it's pretty safe to say that all of us want freedom and equality. But what are we going to do to accomplish the goal? Like it or not, America is our home. Mr. Robeson, I am sure you have been treated better in other parts of the world. Uh, I've been treated with a great deal of honor and respect everywhere but here. I've spent numerous amounts of times in other countries, but always, always, without fail, I long to come back to this America. Yes. An America that doesn't understand me and sometimes won't accept me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've lived all my young years here and I intend to die here. Should I be ungrateful to a land of my birth because she sins? Huh. I mean, like it or not, I do have a choice. Yes. Now, I could leave and never come back or I can stay and fight. Yes. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I ask myself, what should I do when I already know what the answer is? What is your answer? I strongly contend that Negroes need enlist and fight. Oh, not me. On one hand, I say no. Never fight. There's no longer racism in America. Mm. Then how long could that take? Mm. <laughs> take forever. As a representative of the younger generation, I say the most honorable thing to do is to fight. Show them that we got just as much invested in this country as they do. We have even more invested. Our mm. forefathers suffered, bled, and died for yes. that right. Yes. You must be crazy. Uh, Going over there and fight for what, huh? huh mm. Let me tell you something. I ain't fighting for nobody, and I ain't asking nobody to fight. Shit, ask him might get me killed. Hell no. No, he does have a point. Now, you ask the wrong person out there on the street, you might get your head blowed off right on mm -hmm. Central Central Avenue. Now, now, that's just how deep people are feeling about this topic. Won't be no need to go over to Germany or Japan to get killed. Not at all. Recruiters came and asked this one black fella at the plant where I'm working why he wouldn't sign up to fight. He said, those people overseas ain't never did nothing to me. So I ain't got no reason to go over there and fight nobody. Well, they mm. told him that they was going to take him to jail. <laughs> he said, well, take me to jail then. <laughs> While he was in there, they sent him to see a, a psychiatrist. You know, and what that psychiatrist do? He asked him why he didn't want to go to fight. So he told him, why y'all want me to go and fight people over there when the people I'm mad at is right here. Mm -hmm. If you're asking me to shoot up some white people over here, then give me the gun, because I'm mad at a lot of white people right here. Yeah. Oh, I know they kept him locked up. <laughs> oh, no, no. They let him go. But he lost his job as soon as he went back to work. And <laughs> the goon squad was there waiting for him. I don't know if he's alive or dead. Now, if I got to live here in America, fine. But I don't like it enough to be volunteering to get killed. That's right. If I dream about doing something like that, I'm going to wake up and kill myself for doing something so stupid. <laughs> they already say that we're cowards and we don't care about anything but sex and alcohol. Now, is that what you want them to think? Do I look like I care what they think? Lights come up on Lennox in front of the hotel. Reverend Donovan Clayton Russell hurries down the street. Hide it, hide it, hide it, hide it, hide it, Looking good there, Lennox. Don't look at me like that. I know I'm late. Everybody inside. Yes, sir. Reverend Russell enters the lobby. Preach late. Mm, mm, mm. Now, what would happen if every Negro just refused to fight, just stopped and said no? What would happen then, huh? 
Well, mm-hmm. they find a way to string all you Negroes up before they'd allow that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Reverend Donovan Clayton Russell. Mrs. Bass, lovely to see you. Forgive me for being late. I'm just coming from a women's club dinner and they would not allow me to leave without having dessert. And I must admit I had to. <laughs> no, desserts that is. <laughs> Shouldn't be so devastatingly handsome. I thank God for the large and the small blessings, and I thank you for the compliment. And speaking of handsome, who is this classy gentleman in the sharp suit? Reverend Russell, meet Chester Hines. Nice to meet you, Mr. Hines. Mr. Hines is a writer, uh, but I invited him to be a representative for the factory workers at the Navy and Army plants. Lovely, lovely, lovely. I am so glad that you are here. Now, as you know, the greatest influence on the Black community is still the church. And the press. Uh, And the press. (laughs) And the press. All right. Now, what did I miss? Black Wall Street. Mm. Horrible. Horrible. Simply horrible. We can never allow anything like that to happen ever again. Well, I think we all agree on that. Mm. We seem to be at an impasse, Reverend Russell. Half of us are for supporting the war efforts and mm. we have of the side. Pretty much like everywhere else I've been and like everywhere else, everyone has very valid reasons for their very, very personal convictions. Mm -hmm. This certainly isn't about personal convictions, is it? No, no. We can take those to the grave with us and they won't matter. No, it's about the truth, God's truth. Uh, Speak on it. Yeah. I do realize I am in a room with personalities much, much larger than my own. I am greatly humbled because rarely do I find myself in this position. And I humbly thank you all for having me. Truth be told, I'm accustomed to being the number one personality in the room. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yes. Do I know that to be true? (laughs) When you are not there, Mr. Kinlock. (laughs) (laughs) And Dr. Du Bois. How are you? I'm well, Reverend Russell. Very well. Am I ever going to see you in church, Mr. Lomax? No. (laughs) But you do get points for being honest. (laughs) Mr. Robeson. I'm fine. How large is your congregation now? We're between seven and eight thousand. The largest congregation in Los Angeles. Second, but who's counting? <laughs> it's just an honor to be in a position of service. And I cannot wait to hear you sing at first Amy one of these days. I look forward to it. Speaking of honors, I had the pleasure of conversing with Mr. A. Philip Randolph shortly before coming here. He sends his regards. Mr. Randolph is still of the belief that a march on Washington is in order. He's been planning that march for over 10 years. I am in support of the march. Mm -hmm. And I have given my support publicly. But what we need right now is something much more immediate because the problem we face is much more urgent. I know you all agree. So I did what I always do when I'm confronted with a problem I need an answer to. I prayed to the only entity whose personality is greater than anyone in this room. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I prayed, and like every time I prayed, God answered my prayers. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Like usual, my answer came from the most unlikely place. God is wonderful and gracious. Yes. You all must agree. I'm going to yes. 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 letter I've received from a Mr. James A. Thompson. Mm-hmm. Negro grocery store worker in Wichita, Kansas. (laughs) 
Okay, I don't think y'all heard me. I said Wichita, Kansas. Now, I ain't never been to Wichita, but I received a letter from Wichita. Praise God. And this man asked in his letter, how can we fight a war over there? When we have a war right here that needs to be fought, seems to me like we need a victory over there and we need a victory over here. Hmm. Amazing. I mean, might as well have come directly from the mouth of God. This, I thought this idea was brilliant. This is the, I, this is the, this is the slogan I've been praying for, huh? We can use it to galvanize an entire community, held an entire nation of black people, amen? Because what we need is victory over totalitarianism mm. and fascism overseas. And we need victory over racism and discrimination right here in America. It's a war on two fronts, my friends, and that calls for a double victory. I advocate for a double victory. Double V is the slogan because double V is an order. Hallelujah. Double V. Double V. Double V, huh? Well, I kind of I kind of like the sound of that, like, like yeah. hitting a number for a million mm -hmm. straight. Mm -hmm. No combination. <laughs> My boys on the street just might go and take that. <laughs> yes, artists and political dignitaries in Washington, D.C. and New York City would get behind that ideology too. Yeah. Reverend Russell, I like it. And so do I. It gives us a very simplistic and realistic purpose, a, a clearly defined goal. So I say double V. Double V? Double V. Double V. Double v. I don't like it. I love it. I'm going to have some new pamphlets made up immediately and add them out all over Central Avenue. So, so, so let me get this straight. Oh, boy. You're willing to send Black boys overseas <laughs> to risk their very lives in hopes that you might gain some kind of moral victory over here? What have y'all been drinking? No, 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 no. Y'all been smoking some of that good reefer. Oh. That's what y'all been doing. After all the testimony about the Red Summer, Black Wall Street, and don't forget about Rosewood, and I could go on and on. Y'all Negroes gonna consider putting on a uniform, waving a flag, and dying for this country? Oh. Double V this. Kiss my ass. Oh. oh. Himes walks out. Well. Well, Mr. Himes is a colorful personality, I see. Yeah, later for him. Double V. Double, Double, v. V. Double, Double v. v. Double V. Double V. Double V. Lena, Ella, and Lady Day sing those jazzy songs as Duke Ellington plays. Couples dancing and spinning around the Dunbar Hotel just lights up the town. Come on and meet me. Meet me, meet me at the Dumbo Hotel. The Dumbo Hotel. Meet me oh. at the Dumbo, the Dumbo Hotel on Central Avenue. Meet me, meet me at the Dumbo. Meet me, meet me at the Dumbo Hotel. The Dumbo Hotel. Meet me, oh. me at the Dumbo. The Dunbar Hotel on Central Avenue. The Dunbar Hotel on Central Avenue. The Dunbar Hotel on Central 